I like this diagram. Um, this is like a model that we used to have in class. It's a model from like, um, I don't know, 1978. It's not bad though. I'm not gonna go over this model with you. I really want you to come back to this model after we explain things and like trace it with your finger. Trace the entry of blood. Trace the leaving of a red blood cell. Trace the entry of blood. Trace the leaving of a potassium ion. I mean, really, do it visually with your finger. You'll figure things out. You'll be like, oh, oh, oh. When talking about nephrons in general, there are two kinds of nephrons. So I want you to take a look at this picture here on the very, very right. It shows you an inset of the kidney, and it shows you kind of where we are. We're looking at a piece of the cortex, which in your book is always beige, and a piece of the medulla, or the pyramid, which in your book is always pink. So look at the co color coordination on the diagram on the left. So we have, we have two different nephrons, and they're placed differently within the cortex or the medulla. The first kind are the kind of nephrons that are called cortical, and they're the majority of nephrons that you have. Most of the time, they're the ones that are making your urine. Uh, they're so named cortical nephrons because, take a look, they're almost entirely in the cortex. Only that little tiny portion of a loop is looping down deep into the medulla. I know you don't know what this is. I'm not going to explain what this is just yet, but I want you to know that cortical nephrons have a capillary bed called a paratubular capillary bed. The other type of nephrons are called juxta medullary. The word juxta usually means opposed to or next to or in. And these are nephrons that have a loop that goes really, really deep into the medulla. So you can see how different that is in terms of placement of the cortical nephrons. It's these juxta medullary nephrons that you're going to use. And remember, there's only like 15% of them, but you're going to use them when you're sorely dehydrated and you're going to use them to make concentrated urine. Again, I don't know what, I know you don't know what this is and I don't care. <laughs> Juxta medullary nephrons are associated with a vasa recta. That's their capillary bed. All right, let's define those capillary beds. Let's make a difference between the two. I hate the pictures in your book of the two different nephrons and their capillary beds. Hate it. Hate it, hate it, hate it. So, um what I do like is this picture right in the middle. And you can see that there's a juxtamedullary nephron over on the right, and there's a cortical nephron over on the left. And you know that the upper part of this picture is the cortex and the bottom is the medulla because you can recognize that arcuate artery and those cortical radiate arteries going up from it. So you know we're on the border of the cortex and the medulla. Over here on the right, I'm sorry, over here on the left is a cortical nephron with a really messy bed of capillaries called the paratubular capillaries. And that's in purple. So that you can see that that capillary, it intertwines with the nephron itself, it winds around it. And then over here on the right, we have a juxtamedullary with a very organized like meshwork or ladder. And that meshwork seems to be covering mostly that loop into the medulla. So take a look at the difference between the two capillary beds. One of them is completely in the cortex and the other one is completely in the medulla. I want you to understand the pathway of filtration. I want you to understand and use your finger to trace on this diagram where things go and how they move. So let's start down here on the bottom left. I'm a red blood cell. I'm not gonna get filtered, right? I don't enter up in urine. I go back to the renal vein. So I'm a red blood cell, I'm contained in whole blood. I just left the arcuate artery. I'm entering the cortical radiate artery. Now I'm entering this thing called the afferent arterial. And I, I float around here in this knot, this capillary bed here that we'll address soon enough. And I don't enter into the nephron. What I do is I leave by way of this arterial, which is called the efferent, and I go down here and I, I, I float around a little bit in this structure, this purple structure, the vasorecta. 
right? I float around, um, and then I leave the vasa recta, coming back up here to be reintroduced into the cortical radiate vein. I then go to the arcuate vein, and of course I'm going to go to an interlobar and back into the renal vein. So that was a little red blood cell that doesn't get filtered, right? Doesn't end up in urine. So um, I'm gonna erase that. And then let's do, uh, not a red blood cell, but let's do potassium because potassium ends up in your urine, right? You don't like to keep potassium. So I'm potassium, I'm contained in the plasma of your whole blood. I'm gonna enter in this cortical radiate artery. I'm gonna go up here to this nephron though. I'm gonna use the cortical nephron up here. I enter into what's called the afferent arterial. And as a potassium ion, I float around this capillary bed right here, this, this knot, but I don't go into the efferent arterial. I actually, I enter into the nephron. And this tube here that I'm trying to very carefully trace the pathway of, this tube here is the nephron. It's got different parts to it. It's weaving, and as it weaves around, it's exchanging other things with that paratubular capillary, right? And then up here, I'm still a potassium ion. I'm not gonna go back into the capillary. And what I do is I end up, this right here, this pathway is going behind that knot. I end up in this structure right here, which is called the collecting duct. And this collecting duct will lead to that renal pelvis that collects all of the urine in the kidney. So what I've done here on two sides of this picture is I've traced the diagram of something that is always kept and something that is always excused in urine. Um, I want you to go back and use your finger to trace along this diagram. Okay, so we've introduced the nephron. And we get the idea that it's a tube and we see that it's really like uh, twisty and bendy and how can you make any sense of it? This is the diagram that we use as a teaching tool, right? This is not what a nephron looks like. In fact, a nephron bends back on itself. So it's not all stretched out like this. It's almost like if you could make that um, downward loop in the middle a hinge and turn it back on itself like a book. That's really what a nephron looks like. So a nephron has a couple parts to it. This part up here, which is a blood vessel associated with that knot, right? So this area right in here is that knot that we saw. This is called the renal corpuscle. This area down here, and let me highlight it for you, all of this, all of this, this is called the renal tubule. And this is also part of the nephron. This other structure that you have right here, as you can see, I've drawn red blood cells in it. And this would be either the vasa recta or the paratubular capillary. So remember, this is not what it looks like, but this is the teaching tool that we use so that we can understand the exchange between the tubule and the blood vessel. So there's different parts to the nephron. The first part up here is called the glom glomerulus. This is the part I've circled. It's a little bit of nephron, a little bit of blood vessel. Right next to the nephron or the glomerulus is what's called the PCT or the proximal, meaning close to, convoluted, meaning you're not gonna understand it, and tubule. <laughs> next to that, we've got the nephron loop. This used to be called the loop of Henle. Uh, be aware that the left arm is descending, the right arm is ascending. And then over here, we have another tubule that you will not understand, I'm kidding. It's the distal convoluted tubule. These words, convoluted, they remind you that this picture here is a diagram or just a teaching tool and that these tubules are twisty, bendy, and turned back on themselves. Every nephron drains into a collecting duct. In fact, one collecting duct can drain many nephrons. Okay, so let's do the anatomy of that renal corpuscle. That renal corpuscle is, um, it's a knot, like a capillary bed. And remember what I said, it's, it's where nephron meets blood vessel. So down on the bottom, 
we have the afferent arterial right here. This is the afferent arterial. You can see smooth muscle surrounding it down below the circle I've made. And then you can see some cuboidal cells that are surrounding it above the black circle that I've made. And you guys know that the afferent arterial breaks off of the cortical radiate artery. If you don't know what I'm talking about, get a diagram that shows you that. Put your finger on that point where I'm talking about. The efferent arterial, it breaks off and it brings whole blood to this whole filtration process. So we've got red blood cells, potassium, we've got all kinds of stuff that we want to keep, but also stuff that we want to give away. Right here, this is the efferent arterial, and you can see that it's carrying blood away from the glomerulus. It's at this point that we're going to separate things by size. The afferent arterial brings everything in. It's like pasta and water. The pasta ends up in the efferent arterial. Big stuff ends up there. The water, the little stuff, ends up in this area right here, which is the proximal convoluted tubule. Okay, so remember what I said. You're going to float around in that knot of capillaries of blood right there, and then if you're big, you're going to go to the efferent. If you're small, you're gonna go over there to the PCT. When you enter the PCT, I know that my arrow is not showing you that, but when it enters the PCT, the stuff or the water in there, that yellow stuff is called filtrate. It's not urine. It's not urine. Urine is what you pee from your body, what you expel. Filtrate is what's made in your body in a nephron and then will be adjusted to be urine. I mean, this is a bad process here. We're just separating by size. That, that, that might not be good. You know, that's like the first sort of a hoarder. We just took everything out of the house. That's all we did. Okay, so we have to get really into the anatomy of the renal corpuscle. It is not easy to understand. So the first thing I want you to do is take a step back. Think about the whole kidney with its cortex and the pyramids. I want you to think where we are. We're right on the border of the cortex and the medulla, right? And then... What we're looking at here is we're looking at that knot of capillaries that kind of looks like a cup in a ball kind of association. Here are three areas that we know of. We know of the efferent arterial that is a blood vessel, right? We know of the afferent arterial, which bringing whole blood to be filtered. And we know of the proximal convoluted tubule, which has filtrate in it. If you want to right now, you could kind of color in the efferent arterial, at least to this point, um, because it carries blood. What I'm coloring in right now, I'm surrounding like a little window into the efferent arterial. So I've kind of like cut it open there so you can see inside of it. You can do the same to the afferent arterial. This is it. And I've done the same thing. I've cut away a window in the afferent arterial so you can see all of the things that are in it. I know you can recognize the red and white blood cells. Um, we've got some glucose, which is the hexagon. We've got some sodium, potassium. Um, there's, I forget what I wanted the stars to be, but there's some proteins. There's some other things in there. I mean, the afferent arterial carries whole blood. Okay, so let's do some anatomy. What you're viewing here is a serous membrane, and we've discussed these many times before. We talked about the pericardial space with the heart. We talked about the pleural space with the lungs. And all of this stuff is always made by a double-sided membrane. So here's the first side of the membrane, and I'm going to do it in green. These are simple squamous cells. They're like the flattened egg, right? So, I mean, you can barely see them. But these simple squamous cells are the parietal layer of a serous membrane. So they're the outside layer of a serous membrane. The visceral layer is a little bit difficult to understand because the visceral layer actually forms like a stocking over that knot of capillaries, right? So, I mean, we've seen something like this before where the mesenteries of the stomach covered really tubes that went all over the place. So you've got the afferent arterial, and then you've got this big knot of capillaries that seem to have these cells on them that are called podocytes. And that's what I'm drawing here. They're not as spaced out as what I'm drawing, right? They're, they're really next to each other. Um, but these cells called podocytes, 
These are the guys that help in terms of filtration in the kidney, in this part of the kidney. So those are protocytes. They form the visceral layer of the renal corpuscle. We also have this capsular space in here, which is full of filtrate, right? This is all full of the small stuff that enters into this area and doesn't end up in the efferent arterial. One example would be potassium, right? And we know that all of this stuff is headed down the proximal convoluted tubule. Okay, that's not so bad. Let's just fill out some other things. Um, this is a cutaway right here, much like the other cutaways. You can see a little red blood cell in here. So I just wanted you to see that. Um, these other holes right here, like this one and this one, these are actually a result of this fenestrated capillary that's underneath. And we'll talk about that more in just a moment. On the outside of all of this, this structure, the DCT or the distal convoluted tubule actually wraps around the back of this again. And that structure there, it, it's called the juxta glomerular complex. It's an association of the glomerulus and the distal convoluted tubule. So that's what this is right here. This, I'm gonna color it yellow, yellowy orange. This is the distal convoluted tubule. And you know, it hooks up with the loop and the proximal convoluted tubule. These cells in here, these cells on the distal convoluted tubule, these, are actually called the macula densa, and those are chemoreceptors. They sense the level of salt in your filtrate. The juxtaglomerular cells right here, these guys are really communication cells. They're almost like paracrines. They actually distribute a hormone that's then read by the podocytes, and they're like, oh my God, speed up filtration. Oh no, no, slow it down. So I'm gonna use all of these structures in a later lecture, like you know exactly what I'm talking about when I say macula densa cells of the juxtaglomerular complex. Let's say uh, you should make sure that you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> there is one more cell that I forgot. These little cells in here, I don't think your book even mentions them. Those cells are usually called um, extra glomerular cells. We'll talk about them. They're, they're actually muscle cells they can contract. Okay, so what is that structure that we just diagrammed? What does that really look like? I mean, that's not, that, that's not an accurate representation, what we just look like. That's just a picture, that's a drawing that we use so that I can teach you the different anatomical structures. Check out this picture here. This right here is a cortical radiate artery. This right here is an afferent arterial. This right here is the glomerulus. Look at all of the glomeruli that are in this picture. There's all of those knots. They look like a knotted capillary bed, right? Um, look at the capillary beds. I'm gonna color them in blue. That's all of this stuff right here. It looks like a tree branching all over the stuff, all over the place. So those are paratubular capillary beds. Um, you can see a glomerulus with its capsular space up here in this diagram, right? So you can see this parietal layer and then the visceral layer, which actually goes, dips in around the inside, right? And then the other parietal layer on the other side. So this is, again, a serous membrane. You can see a little piece of a tubule right here. That's what this is. That's actually a tubule. It's got like a side cut to it. That's what these are over here. They're tubules that have a side cut to them. Um, so this picture I like. It's got a lot of good labels on it that prepare you for the histology uh, practical. Up here on the top, you can see all of the glomeruli. If you're seeing lots of glomeruli, that's the cortex. There are no glomeruli in the medulla. Go back and check one of the big pictures that we looked at. There are no glomeruli in the tubule, in the medulla. The medulla is all of these little tubules. I think of the medulla like a structure of straws. Right when I used to waitress, I'd take a big handful of straws and put them in my apron so I could hand them out to customers. And that's pretty much what the medulla is. It's an association of straws. And the plastic of the straws are really made up by um, simple cuboidal cells. So you, you have a lot going on here. It's really important to get close to the anatomy of the kidney, right? We're gonna do physiology. And of course, we're gonna use all of these terms and put them in motion and you want to be careful that you, you know, you have a visual 
and you have a definition of a lot of these anatomical terms. Oh, this is a great picture. I found this online. I didn't do this. But this is a great picture um, of uh, glomerulus, right? It, it's showing you nice and clearly. This is the parietal layer of the capsule. This is the visceral layer, but you know that the visceral layer really dips in there and gets around all of those blood vessels. And then look, they've drawn the capsular space for you and then the PCT below it. It's so hard to see, and I would never put this on the histology practical. Oh, maybe I would. Anyway, this is the distal convoluted tubule right here. It's surrounded by cuboidal cells. I know, if I put a picture in the practical, I'd make sure it's beautiful. Um, but you can see the blood vessels in here. You can see the red blood vessels in this place, um, and you can see that capsular space. Uh, this here is an old term. This is now called the renal capsule, but long ago, it used to be called Bowman's, so. All right, let, let's get down to it. Let's get even more microscopic. Check out where we are. Here's a picture from your book. I actually like this picture here on the left. It shows you that parietal capsule, and then it shows you the glomerulus with those podocytes, all right? So a podocyte is a cell that has lots of feet or processes to it. You can see the nucleus of a podocyte. It's in blue, and then you can see all of its little feet coming off. Over here on the right, like this picture, it shows you a podocyte as well. And you can see all of the, pro oh, all of the processes coming off of it. You can see that it even has a, you know, like a intertwined fingers kind of filtration mesh to it. And that is what it has, like intertwined fingers. Underneath it is the capillary. Right, take a look at the capillary, and the capillary is what's called fenestrated. We learned about fenestrated capillaries. Fenestrate or fenestra comes from the word window. And so there's small holes in this capillary, and if you're small enough, you can leak out of those holes like sodium and potassium. And if you're small enough, you can leak through the intertwining fingers of the podocytes. If you're small enough to do both of those things, you'll end up in the proximal convoluted tubule. If not, you'll end up in the efferent arterial. So just when you look at these diagrams, make sure that you are um, orienting yourself. We have the parietal layer. And what we're talking about with the podocytes is the visceral layer. And underneath that visceral layer, because it sticks on the capillary like a stocking, is the fenestrated capillary. This is what it really looks like. Isn't that awesome? Right, so podocytes, which are these cells right here, they have a modified foot, like a, a, a process that comes off and forms that filtration slit or filtration membrane. So inside of this structure is the fenestrated capillary. And again, if you're small enough, you can get through both of these structures and end up in the filtrate that will ultimately become urine. If you're too big, like albumin, red blood cells, white blood cells, that's okay. You'll end up in the efferent arterial. All right, let's shift back again. Let's go back and take a look at this stupid juxtaglomerular complex, right? Remember I said that diagram with the nephron all stretched out. That's not how we look. I mean, that's how we look at nephrons, but that's not how they look. In reality, that loop should be a hinge folding the nephron back on itself so the DCT or distal convoluted tubule comes into contact with the renal corpuscle and the proximal convoluted tubule. So I have lovingly drawn an arrow right here to what's called the JGC or sometimes the JGA. I don't know, I like the word apparatus better than complex doesn't matter, you're talking about this intersection here of the DCT and the renal corpuscle. This is basically a feedback point. What's in the DCT that will soon become urine is feeding back to the renal corpuscle saying, I have this, just letting you know. Okay, so we're gonna talk about like the macula densa. We talked about those cells being chemoreceptors on the DCT. And those are gonna relay some information to the renal corpuscle about filtering sodium. Examine this again. Can 
I let me just do it for you, right? This is the DCT look. It's coming out behind the glomerulus. This is the DCT look. It's coming out behind the glomerulus. That's why I love this picture. So the juxtaglomerular complex or apparatus, it's just a collection of cells that work here in the renal corpuscle and they work together to control the rate of filtration. Whenever you get to a diagram like this, orient yourself. You have the proximal convoluted tubule. Here you have the afferent arterial. Here you have the efferent arterial. We can see that we've got our, our squamous cells out here, right? And we've got a podocyte right here with its filtration slits in yellow. And we've got a cutaway of the capillaries that are contained in the glomerulus with a picture of a red blood cell. So this is the renal corpuscle, but it also includes the cells that work together in the juxtaglomerular complex. The first cells of the juxtaglomerular complex are granular cells. They surround the afferent arterial and they are smooth muscle cells. They're also mechanoreceptors in that they sense pressure or weight or load when the afferent arterial swells with blood. It, um, those cells, they sense the swelling of the afferent arterial and what they do is they contract and they constrict the afferent arterial. They also secrete renin, which will constrict everything else in your body. The next cells that are part of this complex here are the macula densa cells. And they're actually part of the tubule, the distal convoluted tubule. These cells are chemoreceptors and they sense the amount of sodium in your filtrate. And they feed back to the glomerulus, hey, you're filtering too fast. No, you're filtering too slow. The way that they feed back to the glomerulus, because they don't, they don't really touch the glomerulus, is that they use these cells called, that are called the extra glomerular mesangeal cells. I know you're like, what the hell? Just hold on a second, I'll, I'll give you a, a trick to remember them. These cells, all they do is they're just a middleman. They help the granulars and the macula densa and the glomerulus itself kind of communicate with each other because they're touching everything. We also have these other cells, they're kind of hidden in this picture. They're those blue cells that are in between the podocytes in the glomerulus. So these are called mesangeal cells. And these cells, they're contractile. And what they do is they take the filtration membrane and make it smaller. This is kind of like uh, using a big colander to strain like two liters of pasta or using a little tiny colander to do it. So they can choose the size of the filter basically. So you have two types of mesangeal cells here. Um, the mesangeal cells in the renal corpuscle are just called mesangeal cells. The mesangeal cells outside of it are called the extra, meaning outside, glomerular mesangeal cells. You should know the role of all four of these cells because we're going to use examples of how they adjust the filtrate and adjust your urine output. Okay, I, I also like this picture. It's hidden in the back of your textbook. Uh, or in the back of the chapter. You know, you read the chapter, or maybe you look through it at this point, and you get to the last diagram and you're like, yeah, 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 whatever. I, I already looked at this stuff. But it's at this point in the class that these review diagrams are probably a little bit more helpful than some of the in-depth. So we're gonna work on this diagram as we go through this um, PowerPoint. We're gonna do most of our work with it at the end when we describe secretion and reabsorption. Um, the most difficult thing to describe for us though is filtration, which isn't really evident too much on this diagram. But I encourage you to print out the entirety of this diagram. I encourage you to look at the key. What do the blue arrows mean? What are the yellow little circles with the A's? What are the little green circles? What's all this stuff? Right, make sure that you have the background of this diagram so that we can use it to explain what goes on in the nephron.